Chapter 13 Woman and Marriage Forever should the mother with her child be for us the most moving of pictures and a symbol that holds before us the perpetuation of humanity, the loving linking together of the successive generations in the highest glorification. This ideal it is which my brother viewed with the tenderest veneration and treated with the greatest reverence. He regarded it as a very grave danger if, as now appears to be the case, this ideal of the mother with her child were no longer looked upon as the highest. He thought that, with the present direction which the women's movement has taken, emphasis is laid so strongly upon the individual personality with what is often its petty self-seeking and love of comfort that no one thinks to answer the question, what drawbacks for the human race does the movement entail? He feared that under the influence of the unmarried, who usually stand at the head of the emancipation movement, an ideal might arise that would be damaging to the propagation and higher development of humanity, and that thereby precisely the best women, the bravest and most high-souled, would come to look upon marriage with disgust. Elizabeth Forster Nietzsche the Lonely Nietzsche. I should like now to invite my reader's attention to the question of marriage. It will not, however, be marriage considered fully and from all sides, but rather those aspects of it that I think are of special importance for an understanding of woman, or for her best good, or for the most satisfactory fulfillment of her duty to the race. Inevitably, therefore, it will be marriage chiefly from the point of view of the female, but I believe that much I have to say will have meaning for both sexes. For women, the man is a means, the end is the child, and the child is the purpose of marriage. In the Orient, the social function of marriage has always been primary, and in this it has been wiser than the West, at least wiser than the West of the modern era. The primary purpose of marriage, certainly from the point of view of society, is to bring children into the world, and especially superior children, children endowed with higher capacities than those of their parents. And young people, themselves, should focus less of their expectation on marriage as romance. It never was intended to be only the means by which two people lost in each other should find happiness. They should never have been encouraged or allowed to think it was this. Marriage may prove a gateway to heaven, or it may not. Certainly, it will not be all heaven. Bringing children into the world and rearing them properly is an arduous undertaking and a heavy responsibility. It calls for intelligence, knowledge, training, and many of the virtues, notably devotion, patience, capacity for faithful and hard labor through long years, and much self-forgetting. As such, people should approach it with consecration like that of a knight or one taking holy orders. Moreover, if the primary and most sacred purpose of marriage, the purpose of marriage for all noble and intelligent men and women except perhaps a rather exceptional few, is to bring into the world superior children, as superior as possible, then it follows inevitably that eugenic considerations must be of the utmost importance. Scientific evidence, very largely that supplied by genetics, now makes it certain that both capacities and defects run in families, and that the lives of children are shaped more, even much more, by their heredity than by environment. Marriage must now be looked upon as essentially a matter of bringing together two family stocks. What has to be thoroughly examined, therefore, is not merely the specimens of humanity who propose to do the marrying but the entire family background and record of each one as far back as it can be ascertained. And no amount of love or spiritual unity between them should be allowed to sanction any marriage from which children are to be expected if their ancestries betray serious hereditary defects, weaknesses, or abnormalities of body or mind, or even, some would say, capacities and traits in the two records that are widely different. Marriage to be justified, if it is to lead to children, must at least have a sound physical and hereditary basis. But of course, such precautions, essential though I do hold them to be, 
can never of themselves be enough to ensure what I should consider a great and beautiful marriage. For the realization of this, the man and the woman must bring to their marriage, or in their marriage develop, certain emotional and spiritual qualities. These are even more essential than a rich intellectual endowment. There must be deep love between them, and mutual reverence, and, more important than agreement in ideas, their lives must be shaped by the same values and aims. The touch of each on the other must be quickening, vitalizing, exalting, and when it is so, then does their very sexual relationship cease to be an end in itself and become a symbol of the unity that they have found together, at once, holy and hallowing. No matter how well the prospective mates may meet all the requirements as regards ancestry and the like, their marriage can hardly be expected to become one of the most beautiful and life-releasing unless they have found spiritual unity or feel confident that they can grow into it in the course of time. But here too, let me confess my doubt whether marrying for love can be accepted as a reliable guide in this direction. When two young people are in love, are they not commonly so swept away in a flood of emotion that they are unable to make a sound appraisal of realities, or perhaps even to see them? The wart on the end of our loved one's nose may then be glorified into a thing of beauty. Would not mates commonly be chosen more wisely, certainly from the point of view of eugenics, and even from that of personal happiness, if a larger part in their choice were left to the parents, who are older, more experienced, more objective in their point of view, calmer, and more realistic in their perception? They would see the wart, and other things. Perhaps couples coming together thus would often be less in love when they married than is commonly the case among us now, but might not their love last longer? Indeed, if young people were more often thus soundly mated, might not their love for one another be expected to grow deeper with the passing of the years? And for myself, I like it best when there is only one marriage, lifelong, and when old age finds a couple nearer together at the end than they were at the beginning. Maybe then, it would be more commonly a matter of coming to love each other. But nothing can last if sound foundation for it be lacking. The impression that I get from competent and seemingly unbiased observers is that marriages in the Orient, which are entered into more in this fashion than is customary with us, are not less happy, and certainly they are more stable, and they create a stabler social structure. Above all, marriages entered upon thus would be more likely to produce desirable children. And, in all marrying, this is the consideration that we should strive to keep uppermost. Personal happiness should be subordinated to it, and when necessary, even be sacrificed to it. In support of the whole idea of giving parents a large part in determining the selection of mates, Ellsworth Huntington said, in an earlier stage of society, the parents arranged the marriages. The eugenic effect of the old system appears to have been excellent. It tended to ensure the marriage of all the young people of the better classes at an early age. It likewise promoted the union of families of similar grade, so that good stock was in less danger than at present from being diluted by poor. I am not urging that all parents should do all the arranging, but certainly they should have a larger and accepted part in it. Perhaps the very legality of the marriage should depend upon its having their approval. At times, this would doubtless involve great hardship, but no system can be devised that will not at times press heavily upon someone. The best that we can do is to find a system that will most surely conduce to the increasing of quality of life among us, and then pay the price of it loyally. And lest it seem to some of my readers that I am making the requirements for marriage too mechanical and rigid, and dismissing too lightly the happiness and contentment of the individual men and women who must decide whether or not to marry, or whom to marry, let me point out several facts that may relieve this misgiving. First of all, it is to be noted that if young people, and more especially the young people of our superior stocks, were brought up with a fairly definite idea of the sort of mate 
that sound eugenic considerations would in their case prescribe, it would generally determine the kind of man or woman they would look upon with admiration and, as a rule, prevent their falling in love with any person quite unsuited. As a young friend of mine put it some years ago, he found that he tended to love the kind of girl who fitted the picture he had long in his mind. In any case, if it did not have so positive an effect as this, a knowledge of the eugenic requirements would at least set limits, negatively, within which alone one would permit a love relationship to go so far as marriage. But more than this, I recognize and readily allow that the difficulties and riskiness of a marital venture tend to increase with the advance in the mental and spiritual development of the parties involved. It is one thing, and a comparatively easy thing, for a man and a woman of the peasant or laborer type to find satisfaction in marriage. Their rather lumpish natures can settle down side by side and without difficulty find their simple needs and desires satisfied. But a man or a woman of highly developed personality has a sensitivity and bristles with points and angles of taste, conviction, and imperious drive that make it exceedingly difficult to mesh his or her life comfortably and happily with the life of another. To some extent, the difficulty can be met by having the woman married early while she is plastic to a man perhaps ten years her senior. She will then tend to learn from him and to shape her life to fit into his. But even so, marriage will continue to be more of a gamble for those of the highly differentiated development that goes with personality and culture. But even with all this granted, we must go on to acknowledge that more room for the relations of the sexes is needed and must be provided. There has been too much effort to force them into one rigid, standardized mold. This situation probably had its origin, as does the difficulty of correcting it, in the widely diffused feeling that sex is at best a necessary evil to which our concessions should be reduced to a minimum, and in the further fact that our fetish of equality tends to lump all people together without any recognition of the diversity of psychological types and of sexual need that obtains throughout a population. On the one hand, we have saints and sages, like St. Francis and Nietzsche, who at least in the creative period of their lives seem to have required no overt sexual expression whatever. On the other hand, I think of the wife of a friend of mine, who confided to an elderly lady of my acquaintance that no one man could ever satisfy her, and from the observation and from reading of biography, one gets the impression that there must be a considerable proportion of people, both married and unmarried, both men and women, though I suppose chiefly men and chiefly the unmarried, who apparently are unable or perhaps are simply unwilling to try to keep their sexual lives in the channels prescribed by convention. To a large extent, they are anything but depraved or vicious. Often, they are people of the creative type, poets, painters, musicians, and the like. Men such as Burns, Tolstoy, Goethe, Heine, Shelley, Beethoven, and Walt Whitman must immediately come to the minds of all of us and often their sexual relations, though frowned upon by society, are in themselves more beautiful than those of most duly married husbands and wives. Why should we not remove the stigma from such relationships and make room for them? We recognize our indebtedness to the creators for the art and thought which they enrich our lives. Why should we so quickly forget that the freedom from conflicting responsibility that they require in order to fulfill their creative impulses often makes marriage impossible, and that the very energy that enables them to create not uncommonly presses upon them a sexual need that cannot be kept within bounds. It is important to safeguard the essential features of our monogamous family system, yes, and I shall be at some pains to point out later, but I doubt that our whole institution would be in danger of collapse if we allowed that there were some people, often among our most valuable, whose nature or whose circumstances were not such as to enable them to come under its protection 
and to meet its requirements and responsibilities. We might do well to remember that the ancient Hindus had different kinds of marriage and recognized different purposes in sexual relationships. While holding to the monogamous norm, they allowed exceptions. It was perfectly permissible, for instance, and I understand it still is, for a married woman, unblessed with children, to go to a rishi, a Hindu holy sage, with the request that he impregnate her. There was the effort to see that each normal man and woman had the degree of sexual opportunity essential to health or to taking his or her part in the total task of perpetuating the species. In general, they allowed the largest amount of privilege to the more highly developed members of the upper classes. Apparently, a similar condition obtained in China. From some quarters, we are being reminded that our own early Celtic ancestors, Scottish and Irish, had a form of trial marriage, which could be terminated at the end of a year if it proves childless or for other reasons unsatisfactory. On the strength of such examples, it is being urged that it might actually conduce to the durability of our monogamous marriage today if we also allowed couples in the upper levels of our social strata, or perhaps in all levels, and where it was desired by both parties to make their initial marriage contract for one year only. There would need to be an agreement about the support and rearing of the child, if there should be any. At the end of the year, if there were no pregnancy, the contract could either be terminated or confirmed for life, and duly hallowed, as in our present marriage ceremony. This would give one's choice of a mate a basis in experience that is now commonly lacking, and that might help to make the final marriage more lasting. But I confess that I am not prepared to advocate such an arrangement, and I've brought myself to mention it only with hesitation. I cannot forget Dr. Arabella Kinnelly's conviction that every woman's soul remains indelibly imprinted with the memory of the first man to whom she completely gives herself. If she is right in this, and I think that she is, and if a woman's first sexual experience is with a man whom she does not really love, must not such a memory tend to come between her and any other man to whom she may afterwards wish to give herself, and thus prove an element of instability in what she would like to make her real marriage? Also, though it might work well enough for some women, especially those who are lacking in sensitiveness and idealism, I am very much afraid that, at least in an age of decadence like ours, cynicism and irresponsibility would often turn into gross abuse. But the divorce rate among us has become so excessive and indeed alarming that almost any expedient must be given consideration that holds out reasonable hope of reducing it. Those who have made any study of broken homes must realize how grave a disturbance is commonly inflicted upon children when one of the parents moves out of the home. But I myself should be inclined to place supreme emphasis and rest my best hopes on taking the time and making the utmost effort to ensure that a man and a woman are right for each other and for their common task in the first place and then making divorce allowable only in extreme or exceptional circumstances. But in any case, and regardless of the various pros and cons of our discussion so far, let us keep to what after all is our main point. We must ever keep alive, and now, as perhaps never before, deepen our consciousness that marriage is our breeding institution. And by what we breed, we shall live, or we shall die, as a nation and as a race. Even the quantity of our children the average number per marriage can be decisive, but everything hinges supremely on their quality. Without this, there can be no escape from decay, disintegration, and ultimately death. And with this, eugenics comes into its own, as we shall see in due course. At present, the shabbiest and worst elements in our stock are outbreeding our best. On average, the higher you go among those who have proved their intellectual caliber and their character, the smaller is the number of their children. This was brought to public attention at least 50 or 60 years ago. For the last couple of decades, Dr. Elmer Pendel has been pointing out that those who create social problems and burdens 
and those who are a problem by their very existence are multiplying faster than those who alone can solve the problems. Yet, our best stocks, instead of buckling down to have children in the needed number, have been led by scares of a world shortage of food into having only one or two, and leaving it to all kinds of half-breeds and morons to have children by the half-dozen, even though most of them may be illegitimate and all of them become a charge on society. And this situation became confirmed and established among us by the absurd and utterly false notion that we are all equal, and that the having of children is every man and woman's inborn right. This idea has got to be scotched. It must be superseded by a universal recognition that the having of children is a privilege and that the number of children permitted to any couple must always be adjusted to solid evidence as to the kind of children they can reasonably be expected to produce, evidence supplied by IQ tests, actual performance in school and in life, and by the records of their families before them. The permission granted will range from none to no limit. Those at the bottom of the scale will be granted a license to marry only on condition that they first submit to sterilization, which will make reproduction permanently impossible. Those a little higher will be allowed, say, one or two children, on average not enough to perpetuate their kind, and if they exceed the limit set, they will by law have to submit to sterilization, in order to bring their reproduction to a stop at that point. On the other hand, at the upper end of the scale, couples will not only be permitted to have children without limit, but if needed, will even be encouraged by subsidies to have children in the largest number possible. Already for generations, there has been a deadly atavistic trend among us toward undifferentiated mass man, toward the preponderance and the predominance of those with the mind of the caveman. We have been hastening not only towards cultural suicide, but, vastly more ominous, towards national and racial suicide. It is not reversed. We, as a people, shall die, and our civilization will die with us. Thus fearfully does our destiny and our fate hinge on what we make of marriage as our breeding institution. We have now reached the point in our discussion where we must face the question, as difficult as it is important, of standards and practical criteria by which one may be guided towards the wise selection of a mate. What I have said about the necessity of a sound physical basis in this and in my last chapter, I believe to be fundamental. But thus far, it has been too general. We need at least to look into such questions as age at marriage, bodily evidence by which desirability or undesirability may be detected, and the like. In this connection, I must remind you of what I already have said in Chapter 9 about Mr. Ludovici's The Choice of a Mate. On this whole question, I know no other single book that even approaches it. Because of the fact that he had reason to anticipate opposition, the book is heavily loaded with controversial matter and footnotes. For the serious student, both are of the greatest value. But as there is acute need to have his point of view spread widely and take root firmly, especially among young people and their educators. I was long in great hope that eventually an abridgment would be published that would be somewhat easier to read, and yet give all the fundamental conclusions to which Mr. Ludovici was led by his very able and exhaustive research, and by his unusual insight and elevated point of view. It may be objected by some that these conclusions too largely deal with the physical side of the problem, but if one believes, as I do, that we know nothing about spirit apart from the body, or about body apart from the spirit, that the state of the body has its effect on the spirit, and that the quality of our mind and spirit betrays itself in physical marks and lineaments, that we are psychophysical unities, then it is difficult to maintain this objection. In any case, it is a matter of historic record, that people among whom a feeling for quality of life was dominant, people with an aristocratic point of view, gave full recognition to the importance of physical marks as evidence of physical, mental, and spiritual health, 
soundness, and capacity. Ludovici, citing Dr. G.J. Witkowski, says that before Henrietta Maria was finally chosen for Charles I, King of England, she was stripped and examined by a commission of English ladies to decide her fitness for motherhood. And he adds that, according to Froissart, this was a common practice on the continent during the Middle Ages and later. It is interesting that Sir Thomas More advocated it in his Utopia, and that Plato laid down a similar requirement in his Laws. No one needs to be reminded of the place given to beauty among the ancient Greeks as long as they preserved their aristocracies, and those who remember their Iliad and Odyssey must recall in what words beautiful women are there pictured. Of the women of Thebes, which of all the Greek cities had retained the strongest Nordic strain, Sophocles said, they are, through their height, their walk, and their movements, the most perfect of all the women in Greece. Like all the gods and goddesses and heroes and heroines in Homer, they are tall, blue-eyed blondes, who were doubtless admired for the same reasons as the heroes and heroines in a Viking saga of pre-Christian Norway or Iceland. And to turn to another people, Leviticus 21, 16 to 24 records what was believed to be a divine decree that no man should be admitted to the priesthood that hath any blemish, and gives us a fairly long and specific list of what some of these blemishes were. The Hindu laws of Manu and similar books of other great peoples went into these matters in considerable detail. A few samples of the rules and values of ancient aristocratic India must suffice. A twice-born man shall marry a wife of equal caste, who is endowed with auspicious bodily marks. Let him carefully avoid the following ten families, be they ever so great or rich in kind or grain or other property, one, the members of which have thick hair on the body, those who are subject to hemorrhoids, typhus, weakness of digestion, epilepsy, or leprosy. Let him not marry a maiden who has a redundant member nor one who is sickly, nor one either with no hair on the body or too much, nor one who has red eyes. Let him wed a female free from bodily defects, who has the graceful gait of an elephant, a moderate quantity of hair on the body and on the head, small teeth and soft limbs. And in the Ramayana, Ravana says to Sitta, of the right size, smooth and white are thy teeth, Thine eyes are wide and great, unblemished. Thy thighs are as elephants' trunks. Thy two breasts have a fair, firm fullness, and are round, close set to one another, bold, firm swelling. And later Sitha says, The body marks as a result of which the unlucky women are doomed to widowhood. Them do I not see on myself. My brows do not run together. My legs are rounded and not hairy. My teeth? are close set, and the hairs on my body are soft. Such passages with like details could be repeated and supplemented indefinitely, not only from the Ramayana, but from the Mahabharata as well. But I mention them not because the marks they specify and describe are to be accepted as in themselves so revealing and significant that we should give them a like importance among ourselves today. Modern science has enabled us to improve on their marks. I cite them as evidence of an attitude, and this attitude I do think not only healthy, but in the long run essential to our very survival. But when we turn our scrutiny upon our modern democratic and Christian civilization, the contrast in attitude is at the least startling. To those who appreciate what it means, it can be nothing less than shocking. The values that ruled among our own forefathers in ancient times and lasted into our Middle Ages and even centuries later are gone, completely forgotten. Among us today, anybody can marry anybody. Youngsters are brought up without the slightest formulation of what constitutes desirability in a mate, and the parents themselves are as ignorant as their children. Even among those few who do think for the future of their nation and their race, and even for the quality of their own family stocks and seek by wise marriages to enhance it, not one in a thousand 
takes into account the biological foundation on which all these things rest. As compared with spiritual and intellectual qualities, the body is looked upon as of little importance. It is not at all surprising, therefore, that the author of Precious Bane, an otherwise beautiful tale, can bring her book to what she evidently considered a spiritually admirable consummation when she has her hero marry a girl with a hair lip who would certainly and unavoidably transmit her own tragic defect to the gene stock of any offspring she might have. And likewise, Dean Rusk's daughter can marry a Negro without most people's thinking any less of either Dean Rusk or his daughter. In view of the prevalence of the values reflected in such monstrous performances, and of the evident tolerance of them shown by most people, it is all the more remarkable that Mr. Ludovici should have seen the folly of such thinking and set himself, almost single-handedly, to fight for the adoption of a more healthy point of view. He has not only gathered together and correlated the ancient wisdom of past civilization on this matter, but has supplemented that with a remarkable accumulation of the pertinent conclusions of modern science in all its branches. Now, as never before, the human experience by which people may be guided in their choice of mate is available, and it would seem as though it hardly needed argument that men and women should be at least as concerned about the marks of desirability and undesirability in their wives and husbands, respectively, as is a good farmer about the marks by which he can reasonably be sure of a desirable or undesirable horse or cow. It is to my regret that I feel unable in the space at my disposal to give even a digest or summary of the material on this point. I can only advise anyone who has been struck with the soundness and importance of what I have already said about it to study Mr. Ludovici's book for himself. Needless to say, as already pointed out earlier in this chapter, physical marks alone do not settle the whole question of choice. They are primary and fundamental, but also preliminary. One should reject as a mate anyone who cannot first meet the test that they impose. But from among those who do pass it, the final selection must be made by criteria more refined, subtle, and individual, determined by one's own personal experience, taste, character, convictions, and purpose in life. Upon these latter, however, despite the fact that it is they that may finally determine one's choice, I will not dwell. I pass them by here partly because of the very great emphasis I placed upon them in my last chapter, and partly because in those cases where marriage has been contracted with due seriousness, intellectual and spiritual qualities have been so stressed to the well-nigh complete exclusion of the physical that young people have been exposed to the very great danger of discovering too late that they had built a home, not to say a palace and a temple, on sand. Here, therefore, I wish, on the whole, to keep my emphasis on the physical requirements that must be met if marriage is not to fail of its truest end. With this in view, let me now submit a few conclusions as regards marrying to which experience and study have led me. One of the most important general rules is marry your like. Valuable confirmation of this appeared in an article in Reader's Digest, July 1938, entitled Finding a Mate in Modern Society. Its author was Joseph Kirk Folsom, professor of sociology at Vassar College. It was condensed from a book edited by him that bore the title Plan for Marriage, an Intelligent Approach to Marriage and Parenthood proposed by members of the staff of Vassar College. The ideal mate should be one of the same color of eyes and hair as oneself, and, with sex taken into account, of corresponding size. He should be of the same national, religious, and cultural background. There is reason to believe that wisdom would even urge the choice of one in whose ancestry the same callings have been commonly followed as in one's own, or in which distinction has been in the same fields. This should increase the chances that more of the potentialities that make for distinction, or such potentialities with heightened vigor, would appear in the offspring. Even where the physical inheritance of human capacities is still too uncertain to establish a case for this, 
and even though it be admitted that of acquired characteristics there is no physical inheritance whatever, still in every family that has distinguished itself repeatedly in the same field, there is a garnering of experience that can be transmitted to offspring by instruction and by something like apprenticeship, and which gives an invaluable advantage to the youth that is born into it. I am convinced that, whether from the point of view of physical heredity, or cultural inheritance, or both, there is at least a considerable measure of sound ground for the position held in caste societies that a man and a woman from different caste, largely connoting difference in occupation, should not marry. In this democratic society of ours, in which feeling for family, blood, race, tradition, level, rank, and difference has been almost entirely lost, there seems to be a general prejudice in favor of a person's marrying, not his like, but one who is unlike himself. Probably this is due, at least in part, to the feeling of personal inadequacy that is likely to be prevalent in a democracy. It shows itself in the desire for a mate who will complement oneself to make up for one's own defects and deficiencies. Moreover, there is a very strong and ancient taboo against inbreeding, which is very much a matter of marrying one's own kind. To mention the word incest is enough to suggest what I mean. And yet, a very strict interdict against marriage with members of a different race was very common among the culturally most significant peoples of the ancient world. I shall go into this later at length in my chapters on eugenics, which will follow this. We shall there discover the genetic basis for the, pro for the popular taboo against inbreeding, but see that inbreeding is nevertheless the quickest and surest means known for purifying any stock, on the condition that any defectives that it produces will be eliminated. Professor F. A. E. Crewe, one of the world's foremost genetic authorities, pronounced incest between individuals of undoubtedly sound stock a sound biological proposition, and others of like distinction have declared that it may be a decidedly valuable means not more for eliminating defects and weaknesses from human stock than for conserving and concentrating superior qualities. Unquestionably, many generations of ignorance and disregard of all considerations of breeding in relation to marriage have left our stocks horribly overloaded with defectiveness of all sorts. Undoubtedly, too, while our Christian and democratic sentimentality continues to dominate the minds of men, it would be impossible to deal with the large crop of defectives that inbreeding would surely bring to the surface. That is to say, those most desperately in need of wisdom are the least able to recognize it or act upon it when it is placed before them. For the present, therefore, it would seem that the most that can be done is for those of demonstrably sound ancestry to make it a rule to marry their like as much as they can. Among them, cousin marriages are not only safe, but highly desirable. We can also undertake to disseminate the facts about inbreeding and thus prepare for the day when our descendants may share the prejudice against marrying aliens that was so firmly rooted among all great peoples in all ages. History clearly indicates that the people who rise above false sentimental humanitarianism and devise means to apply carefully and intelligently, but firmly, the established scientific facts about purifying and stabilizing their stocks will in the long run, provided their initial stock be sufficiently gifted, lead the world. Second, for your wife, choose a woman who is beautiful. There can be little doubt but that Edward Gibbon spoke the truth when he declared bodily beauty to be an outward gift that has seldom been despised, except by those to whom it has been refused. See the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but it has been the tragic fate of the peoples of the West to have their destiny largely taken over by Christianity before they had fairly got on their feet. And from its very beginning, Christianity took root in the ghetto of the dying Roman Empire, and at once set its dregs to infecting, undermining, and overthrowing all the old aristocratic values of the Nordic peoples by whom Rome, like Greece, had been largely founded. Thus we find ourselves the heirs of a tradition 
that has long despised the body and the physical in which beauty has been at times even feared and condemned as a temptation of the devil to pride, to the lusts of the flesh, and in short to sin, so that most of us have largely lost the natural instinct to regard beauty as a good sign, as evidence that the individual who possesses it is well constituted, harmoniously put together, and filled with vigor and health. Professor Knight Dunlop, who made a special study of this matter, said, Whatever its importance for the individual, beauty is for the race and for civilization of such profound importance that no other fundamental consideration of human welfare and progress can be divorced from it. Ugliness, it is true, is often skin deep, but beauty, never. Beauty is something which depends upon the whole organism. After examining the foundations for this position, he concludes as follows. It is evident now that whether there are the considerations or not, the most important element of the beauty of any individual is the evidence of her or his fitness for the function of procreating healthy children of the highest type of efficiency, according to the standards of the race and ability to protect these children. The standard of beauty in complexion, whether light or dark, is that which goes with the full bloom of sexual vigor. When the human organism is at its perfect development for the perpetuation of the species. Human beauty is a sign of fitness for parenthood, fitness to propagate children who shall be, in high degree, able to hold their own in the mental and physical struggle with nature and with their human competitors. It is the sign which is intuitively recognized by the race and upon which the process of sexual selection is based. It is therefore nothing superficial. It is the external appearance of the germinal possibility which is the most important of all things for society. It would seem then, in a word, that for any given people, beauty is the sum of all those qualities which through an immense stretch of time they have become accustomed to observe in those of their own stock best fitted to perpetuate the species and to protect offspring. As such, it is obviously a sign of absolutely primary importance for life. And that other peoples, peoples of ancient times, better constituted and with sounder values than we, have given beauty much the place of importance that Dr. Dunlap ascribed to it, may be seen by the frequent references to it in the two great Indian epics, especially in the older of the two, the Mahabharata. The passages from these are quoted in J. J. Meyer's Sexual Life in Ancient India, already so often referred to. Phrases like the following are constantly recurring. Maiden with the lovely waist. The fair-hipped one. The maiden pritha of the great eyes. Thou maiden with faultless limbs. Thou with the lovely smile. Thou with the elephant's gait. The woman of incomparable form showing by the build of her body that she can give life to many sons. A splendid woman shining with beauty like another Lakshmi, quite without blemish, with lovely teeth divinely formed, shining like a lotus flower cup. The slender, faultlessly limbed Drapadi, from whom is wafted a croca away, a scent like that of the blue lotus, and so on endlessly. Meyer concludes thus, the frequently seen ideal of the Indian is of lovely women in the bloom of youth, with long lotus eyes, rounded arms, swelling breasts, with great swelling hips and thighs like banana stems, lips red as the bimba fruit. And Manu says, if the wife is not radiant with beauty, she will not attract her husband. But if she has no attractions for him, no children will be born. If the wife is radiant with beauty, the whole house is bright. But if she is destitute of beauty, all will appear dismal. Doubtless, as Dunlop suggests, opinion as to what constituted beauty would vary according to the standards of race, which had been evolved in relation to the particular environment in the face of which each race had to make its way. And there is no question but that there is need among us for criteria by which we can be guided in our judgment of whether or not a person is beautiful. To supply this lack, and guided by the remembrance that the most important element of the beauty of any individual 
is the evidence of her or his fitness for procreating healthy children of the highest type of efficiency. I am going to follow the example of the ancient Hindus and other well-constituted peoples and venture to suggest some marks of desirability in a woman. Bodily symmetry and fragrance, bloom of skin and a certain radiance about the face, especially light in the eyes, are all external evidence of inner harmony, signs that a woman has been well put together and is in good working order. An atmosphere of poise is invaluable as an index of mental and spiritual potentiality and of the effective integration of all her capacities. The feet should be well arched and neither too large nor too small, the legs shapely, full, and rounded. Dunlop says that the percentage of women who would be even moderately presentable as bare-legged dancers, regardless of dancing ability, is so low as to be shocking. The hips should be wide apart, providing in the pelvis ample room for bearing and delivering the child. The frequency of the mention of the hips in the ancient Hindu's description of female beauty makes it very evident how instinctively they included pelvic breath in all their requirements. And I am convinced that it cannot be by accident that the very apparent modern admiration for narrow hips, slim form, the male-like figure in woman, on the one hand, and feminism with its secret envy of the male, contempt for the female, and aversion for childbearing, on the other hand, have all appeared among us at the same time. Yet, from the point of view of the race, preference for narrow hips in woman is the most obvious folly. It is a sign of degeneracy. The breasts in a maiden should be well filled and rounded, without being heavy or pendulous. The body should be free from any excessive hairiness, especially from all coarse hair. The head hair long and lustrous. Bobbed hair in women is a shame. For ages, her beautiful hair has been one of woman's glories, and inevitably, much of its beauty is lost if it is cut short. The breath should be consistently sweet. Foul breath, besides being repulsive, is invariably a sure sign of bad teeth, bad digestion, or some form of uneliminated poison in the system, if not of actual disease. The hand should be shapely, full, and supple. The nails both shapely and free of defects in their surface. The ears should be properly formed, of the right size for the head, pink to pale red in color, set at fairly close angle to the head and neither too far forward nor too far back. The chin should be well developed without being protrusive. The mouth large rather than small, the lips full rather than thin, and naturally red and turned up slightly at the corners, I repeat, naturally red. The use of any kind of makeup if it does not belong to the arts of the prostitute as I declared when I wrote the first version of this chapter years ago, certainly makes any woman who resorts to it a walking advertisement that she lacks what she pretends to have. The eyes should be large, open, gentle in their expression, and full of light. The lengths of the principal parts of the body, trunk, arms, legs, and so on, should be in the right proportions. For a good opportunity to give a woman's body searching scrutiny, let a man follow Ludovici's suggestion and take her to some beach where surf will remove all that does not belong to her and where he can see her in a modern bathing suit. This does not leave much hidden. But if a man is to marry a wife who is beautiful, it is necessary that he marry her while she is young, for the perfect bloom by which nature announces a maiden's readiness for motherhood comes while she is yet in her teens, and begins to wither before she is past them. But on other very important grounds as well, it is urgent that a girl marry before she is twenty. Such a pronouncement is likely to give offense to those who have their hearts set on a college education for girls before marriage. Of that I am fully aware. But before I attempt to reply, let me ask my reader to be patient with me and listen carefully to what I have to say in support of the proposition. Ludovici has collected and analyzed 21 reports, dating from 1883 to 1933, of cases of first childbirth. The reports were put forth by professors and doctors, most of them apparently obstetricians and gynecologists, connected with large city hospitals on the continent. The cases number scores of thousands. Ludovici's analysis of these reports led him to the following conclusions. 
the more closely they approach the present age and the modern scientific view, the more inevitably are we driven to the conclusion that labor before 20 is more favorable than after, and that the decline in efficiency is rapid after the 20th year. The reasons for why a first childbirth is best before the mother has reached the age of 20 are mainly biological. Before that time, the bones and muscles and joints of the pelvis are soft and flexible, and will remain so if the first of a succession of children has come in the mother's teens. Whereas, hardening, stiffening, and ossification set in rapidly after the 20th year. The biological urgency that the first childbirth come early is so well presented by Dr. Hugo Selheim, that eminent authority, in the following passage that I feel I must quote it at length. He says, The transient function, childbirth, in which an adequate passage has to be made for the fetus by stretching the muscles of the pelvic floor to the limit of their elasticity, i.e., without damage to their essential and permanent function of keeping the pelvic outlet closed, can be performed by the pelvic floor only in normal, healthy, and fully developed girls in whom the muscles are still resilient. In older primipare, women given birth for the first time, not only is the extra tissue growth in the birth canal necessary for the function defective, but there is also imperfect resilience and defective increase of elasticity at the critical moment. To compensate for the defects, the tissues are stretched beyond the limit of their resilience, with tears and lacerations as the result. In the youthful elastic primpare, however, this extreme compensatory sacrifice is only exceptionally called for and on a much smaller scale. Only female organisms just attained to fully development seem capable for further bodily development during pregnancy, for this is precisely what is necessary to secure perfect functions in motherhood, more especially in forming the birth canal without damage. An organism which has already waited a long time in the developed state is no longer fit for this function and it seems to me, therefore, that the practice of allowing women to wait beyond their 20th year for marriage, a practice sanctioned even by doctors, amounts to no more than tranquilizing the public by glossing over our present-day social conditions, which cause men to settle down late in life. He adds, comments Ludovici, that the marriage of a woman over 20 amounts to the deliberate scouting of the most favorable conditions for childbirth. Further. In the woman who has had her first child in youth, the pelvic floor retains its capacity to form the birth canal for later births without damage, because this capacity is acquired with her first birth, provided this occurs at the right time. Moreover, easy labor, such as commonly attends youthful childbirth, means greatly diminished risk of puerperal sepsis. The interim report of the Departmental Committee on Maternal Mortality and Morbidity says, among the predisposing causes of sepsis, the most important are undoubtedly injury to the tissues during labor, exhaustion, and hemorrhage, which of course are chiefly attendant upon labor that is difficult and prolonged. And the digest of Nicola's report on childbirth in girls between 13 and 17 states categorically that puerperal fever and septicemia are extremely rare. Prolapse of the uterus also seems to be associated with relative senility at the time of first childbirth. Dr. M. Fetzler, a pupil of Dr. Selheim, remarking on 200 cases of this ailment observed at the Tübingen Clinic, says that the chance of incurring this disability were almost three times greater in primipare of 28 than in primipare of 20, 12 times greater in primipare of 30 than in primipare of 19, and before 19 the chances were nil. In other words, from the point of view of the good of the mother, in order that her childbearing be safe and easy, it is of the utmost importance that she have her first baby while she is young, preferably before she is 20. Indeed, the primary point of Mr. Ludovici's whole book on childbirth is that it should be an experience the mother finds at least painless, as are all other functions in a healthy organism and even enjoyable, and always profoundly satisfying, as he has gathered together a most impressive array of evidence from outstanding authorities, male and female, from every part of the civilized world, that childbirth of this sort actually occurs, that it should be taken as the normal experience, 
and may be expected to become common, if not universal, once women fulfill certain specific conditions, and once we are purged of the degeneracy that now afflicts more or less all civilized people of the Western world, male and female alike. The position that he takes was largely supported by the testimony of Dr. Gertrude Nielsen of Oklahoma City at a symposium of the Section on Obstetrics and Gynecology of the American Medical Association at its annual session on May 14, 1936. This doctor, herself the mother of three children born without twilight sleep, rose up to protest against the move or the tendency to make the administration of anesthetics in childbirth a matter of routine. She declared that it was essential for the sake of some satisfaction deep in a woman's psyche that she be fully conscious all the time that her baby was coming. The report of what took place is eminently worth reading in full. That Dr. Nielsen's attack was no isolated protest is evident. Several of the county's outstanding obstetricians came to her support. Significant excerpts from the article read as follows. A dramatic attack on the use of twilight sleep for painless childbirth was made here today by several of the county's leading obstetricians. A storm of protest broke loose after various doctors had reported the development by them of what they declared to be the nearest to a perfect drug for painless childbirth yet found. In nearly 90% of the cases they reported, the mother had no memory of the event, while at the same time the drug had proved to be completely harmless to the infants. The attack was led by a woman obstetrician, Dr. Gertrude Nielsen of Oklahoma City, herself the mother of three children who had been born without the use of painless methods. Several male obstetricians came to her support, including Dr. Joseph B. DeLee and Dr. J. L. Baer of Chicago, Dr. Buford G. Hamilton of Kansas City, and Dr. Nicholas J. Eastman of Baltimore. One of the physicians stated that Dr. Nielsen had given expression to sentiments that many male obstetricians had been thinking for a long time but had not dared to speak up. The discussion reached its climax when Dr. Rudolf Holmes of Chicago, who first introduced twilight sleep into the United States from Germany 20 years ago, rose and expressed regret for what he had done. I was the man who first brought scopolamine to America, Dr. Holmes said. I didn't know what I was doing. I have found out since. We must protest vigorously, he added, against making the human mother an animated mass without mentality. Childbearing is so essential an experience for a woman, said Dr. Nielsen, that the thwarting of its normal course by the excessive use of analgesics may cause great damage to her personality. If she be carried through delivery in an unconscious state, she is deprived of the experience of giving birth to her child, and in some cases will pay for this escape from reality by nervous disorders. In my observation, no woman, whether intelligent or unintelligent, wants the birth of her baby a blank memory. Certainly none will wish to be relieved of pain at the risk of harm to her baby. Dr. Nielsen gave her opinion that the much-discussed high maternal mortality rate was in large part a result of the great increase of the use of analgesics in childbirth. An analgesic that is perfectly safe for both mother and child has not been discovered, she declared. The use of anything that deadens sensation distorts the natural process of childbirth and depresses the respiratory functions of the child. Drugs delayed birth, she asserted, and psychoanalysis had shown that many of the nervous disorders of adult life in women could be traced to the psychological injuries of unnatural birth. The pains of childbirth have been grossly exaggerated in the minds of American women, Dr. Nielsen said, so that they are in deadly fear of the approaching event a fear which in itself was largely responsible for the actual pain suffered. The obstetrician, Dr. Nielsen stated, could allay the prospective mother's fear by explaining to her that the pain was largely in the minds of magazine writers. In doing this, she added he might be largely aided by trying to preserve in the mother the natural feeling of elation that is a concomitant of prospective motherhood. Believe me, I am not exactly one to rejoice in pain for anyone. On the other hand, it is a question whether our ease-loving age has not developed a fear of pain that is almost psychopathic. It seems to me an essential condition of existence on this earth that whoever would do anything of real consequence must expect to bear pain of one sort or another, physical or mental. 
I honor the spirit of the mother who wrote the article entitled Painless Childbirth in the American Mercury for June 1939. After protesting against mothers being unconscious when the greatest event of their lives takes place, she goes on to declare that even if there be pain in it, childbirth is pain that goes places and does things. There is even, and I am prepared for sneers, a certain ecstasy in it, and it leaves no aching memory. Normal birth can be a relatively easy process. I am convinced that the painless methods are often dangerous and cowardly. Women can enjoy the birth of their children to the full, physically, mentally, and emotionally. It would seem to me that the answer is to counsel women to bear with heroism, sprung of love, whatever pain childbirth may bring, but at the same time strive to eliminate all the pain that is not necessary. The way to this last, however, is not to drug parturient women into unconsciousness, but to begin much further back. We must reform our mating customs, like must marry like. Our women must marry young. Our wives must be brought up with an understanding of the absolute necessity of the particular regimen required for a healthful pregnancy and of an all-around healthy life before pregnancy. Otherwise, childbirth will be the horror that it so evidently had been to the women who, in the letters to the New York Times, sent up a wail of angry protest against the attitude of Dr. Nielsen. Instead of finding the trouble in themselves, in their own degenerate condition, where undoubtedly it lay, they would make agonized childbirth normal, and indignantly pleaded for anesthetics. The simple truth is that childbirth is likely to be not only safe for the mother, but an experience of joy upon the fulfillment of certain conditions, one of the most important of which is that it come early in the mother's life. But from the point of view of the child also, it is urgently to be desired that he come into the world without too much difficulty. It is notorious that irremediable injury is often done to babies in instrumental deliveries, and Freud, I believe, maintains that a child carries with him through all his future days a subconscious memory of his birth experience, and that this memory conditions his whole future outlook on life. What measure of truth there be in such an idea I do not know, though it seems to me rather plausible but if it has any foundation in fact, it is again highly important that birth be easy. And this, as we have seen, means that as a rule, the first birth should come early in the life of the mother. Of course, everything that vitally affects the well-being of mothers and children is of supreme consequence to the race. A race literally stands or falls with its women and with the number and quality of their offspring, and therefore the race has vital interest in early marriage and early childbirth from the point of view of a woman's fecundity. Professor S. J. Holmes says that the liability of women to conceive falls off quite rapidly after the 20th year, and also that Galton has established the fertility of women marrying at the ages 17, 22, 27, and 32 as roughly in the ratio of 6, 5, 4, and 3 respectively. An increase of the average age at marriage, therefore, would have a potent effect in lowering the birth rate. And decline of the birth rate in the stock of the proven capacity is something that no civilization can stand. That the birth rate in this quarter should somehow be raised has become simply a matter of life or death, in the, in the most literal sense. And the evidence shows that early marriage on the part of our best women would make this possible. And finally, Early marriage is so fully in accord with nature's obvious intention and so largely solves the problem of sexual repression on the female side that so far as biology is concerned, it would seem difficult to find any grounds on which to base an intelligent objection. It certainly is a gross violation of nature that a girl whose sexuality develops at an age of 13 or 14 should undertake to deny it all outlet for 10 or 15 years, as Puritanism, feminism, and industrialism combined require of our women today. Our sexuality is only one manifestation of the total measure of vigor and vitality with which we have been endowed, so that the better constituted a person is, the more desirable he is as a specimen of his sex, the more certain he is to have strong sexual desires. 
and complete suppression of all this surging vitality for 10 or 15 years, as is presupposed in modern marriage, in the great majority of cases, simply is not possible to either sex. I was not brought up to believe this, but slowly, through 40 or 50 years, widening knowledge has convinced me that it is a fact. Masturbation, neurotic disturbance, psychic distress, homosexuality, and premarital intercourse are the inevitable and almost universal concomitants of the attempt at complete suppression. Several studies of the sexual life of the unmarried woman, reports of doctors and psychiatrists, and revelations in such books as Judge Ben Lindsay's Revolt of Modern Youth and the notorious Kinsey Report long ago made this indubitable. Soon the talk among college students was indicating that premarital sexual relationships, even among the upper classes, were fast becoming majority practice. And now, in 1970, the official opening of women's college dormitories to men, day and night, suggests that this is well along toward becoming universal. I find this exceedingly disturbing. If long continued, it must mark the end of our family system. And without the family, which has been the chief foundation of all civilized life for thousands of years, I believe that neither our nation and race nor any other nation and race can long survive. If the family is to be preserved, then it is essentially that, as largely as possible, our women should come to marriage virgin. And this can be accomplished simply by establishing the custom that our women marry early. This alone would solve the whole problem of sexual repression on the female side. In short, there was absolutely no need that our young women, in the name of easing their sexual tension, should get into the way of giving themselves to one man after another, as will certainly tend to be the case, and thereby letting themselves be soiled by the touch of men, who in another day and age would have gone to prostitutes. And if in their fanatical pursuit of equality with men, and by their thoughtless and headstrong determination to throw off all restraints and to do what they feel like doing, regardless of consequences, they thereby threaten to break up the foundations of all national existence and significance. Then the day will certainly come when men, individually and collectively, will have to take them in hand and, where necessary, by force, put them in their place. The family, the home, and the cradle are essential to survival and nothing that threatens their welfare can be tolerated. The ancient Hindus were dead right. Every woman from birth to death should be under the ward of some man. If she is to fulfill her function properly, then she cannot be allowed independence. But early marriage, marriage before 20, would nowadays be frowned upon. Child marriage, we hear someone exclaim, that's bad enough in India, but let's have nothing to do with it in a civilized country like ours. I presume that such an attitude would have the almost overwhelming support of any intelligent community of the Western world, and it should be especially ardent from all those who have their hearts set on a college education for women. But once again, before replying to this, let me ask my reader to hear out what I have to say for the proposition. In our day, at least until very recently, Marriage in which the bride is under 20 is commonly looked upon as hardly decent. And yet, there is evidence aplenty that even in England, the land from which most of the original stock of this country was derived, throughout the Middle Ages, the period which Henry Adams and President Hutchins of the University of Chicago regard as the apex of our civilization, marriages were frequent in which the bride was not only 16, but 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, and even younger. This was true not only among the common people, but also, and most certainly in the upper classes, and in the royalty. Henry VII, one of England's greatest monarchs, was born of Margaret Beaufort when she was under 14, and many other of England's kings similarly. Indeed, early marriage continued to be common in England down to the beginning of the last century, and these were periods that showed in the population a greater vigor and vitality, a greater poise, stability, and contentedness, and a far richer and more significant cultural creativeness than is to be found among us. 
We shall do well to remember, too, in passing, that Napoleon's mother was only 18 when the hero of Austerlitz was born, and that Goethe's mother was married at 17 and was only 18 when the poet was born. Indeed, down through history, the general rule in all ages and in all lands has been for women to marry young. And it is only our false prejudices, the perverted and degenerate ideas prevalent today about women and women's role, and our absurd conceit that we are above and in advance of other periods, which prevents early marriage among us. From the point of view of the best good of the race, there can hardly be any question but that as a rule, the most desirable age for a woman at the time of marriage is between 16 and 18. At that time, she stands at last in full flower, at the height of her desirability as a woman. It is as though all nature conspired to say, through the entire ensemble that she is, I am ready. It gives me considerable satisfaction to be able to note here that nowhere have I found a more complete endorsement of this position than from Laura Morholm, whom I quoted in my last chapter. And because, being a woman, she may perhaps speak on this matter with more authority and with more understanding than I can. I am going to quote what she has to say at some length. Laura Marholm, really Mrs. Laura Moore Hansen, a Swedish woman, wrote at the beginning of this century. Most of her books were addressed to or were about women. I have found her studies in the psychology of women so invaluable that I can but hope that it may someday be republished, for it is written beautifully eloquently, and with such breadth of knowledge, with such depth of sympathy for women, and with such understanding of their nature, that for any woman it ought to prove very moving and impressive. And here is what she says about a girl's age at the time of her marriage. In the young girl of healthy vitality, the period between 15 and 17 is really her blossoming time. Everyone perceives the fragrance which hangs about her whole young being, making the insignificant charming, the homely engaging, and first revealing beauty. The bloom of the skin, the sparkle of the eyes, the slender graceful suppleness of the body, everything is blooming health and elasticity. People imagine this is something purely physical, which changes so quickly on that very account. But how if it changes so quickly because it is more physical than physical? An almost instant unfolding of all the expansive capacities for complete womanly feeling in which there is yet no reflective thought. Why does the blood come and go so quickly in her cheeks? Because she undergoes great bodily agitation? Or because presentiments, ideas which are knowledge, connections of sympathy not yet become thoughts, glide through the soul of the young girl at the slightest outward provocation. Why does she feel this loud tumultuous heart beating at the approach or greeting of a man, which becomes still louder because she fears it may be heard? Why does she so often drop her eyes and grow confused? Why are her slender hands so warm and moist that the crochet needle rusts in them? Why does she often grow pale under a glance? so pale and so suddenly that one thinks her about to faint. Are these only physical appearances, without her knowledge? Or does she know only too well and blush or pale with double violence because she fears it can be red in her face? Many believe the former, and the mothers always say excusingly, she is still so innocent, she is still quite childish. I believe that she is perhaps never again in her life so little childish as then. The years when people no longer think her childish are quite frequently a great step backward towards childishness. In this short time of blossoming, and perhaps only then in fullness, everything in the young girl is readiness. There is readiness of the soul and mind, a capacity for intuitive understanding, for unrestrained devotion, an unbroken instinct. Nothing is perverse in her, and she is still so pliant that nothing tears wounds in her. And if she does not marry and become pregnant while this bloom and invitation are yet upon her, the effects are plain to all who have eyes to see or the intelligence to know what they mean. Day by day, year by year, she withers. 
the bloom that was upon her slowly fades away, never to return, and in its place comes disappointment. Every month is a mock confinement. Throughout her whole body, she gets ready to be a mother, and then nothing comes of it. Frustration, and more frustration. Menstruation becomes more difficult. The pelvis hardens. The whole reproductive system is seized with a deterioration that in many cases becomes outright cancer. But perhaps it is again Laura Harholm who can reveal the situation best. She, the young girl to whom a man has not come, prefers to sit still, and her eyes become dull and dreamy. Languishing, we call it. But it is not that. It is disappointment. So far as I understand it, it is the very deepest disappointment of her whole life, penetrating body and soul, for it springs from the feeling of a dissolving unity. The woman never again possesses herself so completely. She is never again so susceptible mentally, so awake, so capable, never again so pliant bodily, so strong and ready. In any case, there is no question but that a girl is quite able to bear children within a few years of the onset of puberty, to state the facts conservatively. And it simply is not possible for a person of unbiased mind to believe that nature, equipping a woman to bear children in her early teens, ever intended her to put off beginning for 10 or 15 years until she was in her middle or late twenties, not to speak of her thirties. In fact, I believe the only objection to this position will come from those who consciously or unconsciously are feminist. From them, a loud wail will go up about the horrors of childbirth and the early aging of mothers of many children. But the material that I already have presented makes it impossible to take this outcry very seriously or to listen to it with much patience. The facts of the matter seem to me to be as follows. Nature punishes us only for doing a thing or for not doing it, never for both. One or the other has her favor and is rewarded with health, and only the other is punished. And we already have seen how it is failure to make reasonable use of the female reproductive system that tends towards organic degeneration and actual cancerous organic disintegration. If therefore it is woman's primary function and the deepest instinct of her being to bear and to rear children, and about this no one can be more unequivocal than Laura Marholm, then it must follow that a well-constituted woman will have a deeper serenity and sense of fulfillment if her youth is guided by a sound regimen of diet, dress, healthful exercise that does not harden the pelvis, as male athleticism does, and if she marries before the first great turning point of a woman's life, her twentieth year. A man of her own kind and of corresponding size, from whom she receives both economic and emotional security, and if she follows a wise regimen during her pregnancies. Further, she will actually enjoy better health if she bears a child every second or third year of her bearing life. All this feminist wail about the cost of motherhood is only evidence of degeneracy, and it is the effort of the diseased and perverted to infect the healthy and well-constituted. But probably the feminist protest against early marriage for women will wax most angry over the fact that it would make impossible the college education that the modern woman requires for the successful pursuit of a career. It is argued that even to make a good mother, a woman must have more education than would be possible if she married before twenty. In any case, the feminists demand to be told how much education would be possible under the circumstances and what kind would be desirable. This is not the place for an extended discussion of the question, but it can be answered in outline. A girl's education should be fundamentally different from that of a man. I would remind you that Dr. Carell says, the same intellectual and physical training and the same ambitions should not be given to young girls as to boys. Educators should pay very close attention to the organic and mental peculiarities of the male and the female, and to their natural functions. Between the two, there are irrevocable differences. The girl's education should center where her own deepest instinct and interest and capacity center, about the child, which means also about homemaking. She should be instructed 
as to her own physiology and know how to take care of herself during pregnancy and at all times. She should learn how to take care of a baby and understand the principles of sound diet and health, both for the child at different stages and its development and for the adult members of her family. So much depends upon this and know how to treat simple ailments. The art and the practice of making a home lovely and of creating an atmosphere expressive of herself and her husband with definite regimen, rules, and standards for such simple things as washing dishes and clothes, making a bed, and cleaning a room, and doing it efficiently. The knowledge of how to plant and to grow vegetables and flowers, to set a table attractively, to prepare tasty and wholesome meals, to preserve foods of all kinds in various ways, to spin and to weave and to dye, to make clothes for herself and her family and to mend them, together with a knowledge of other handicrafts. For the day of handicrafts in the home will come back in an age that is economically sounder than ours. All this lies within her province. And not least, she should be prepared to bring the unfolding mind and aspiration of her children the study of nature and a love of the earth, and also the folklore of her people, their great myths, their great epics, their great heroes, and the heart of their religion, their literature, their art, their music. Indeed, it might often be the mother who would awaken in her children an interest in and a love for the art and literatures and music of the world. Much of this, however, would require no formal schooling. To a considerable extent, she would simply absorb the culture of the race and transmit it. A great deal of what young women need to know, they would simply pick up from their mothers and from the life of their homes, as their children in turn would pick it up from them. With this, their girlhood reading and a schooling shaped from the start to meet their future needs as mothers, they could be ready for marriage before they were 20. And as a rule, at least until there was a child, study could be continued in the schools even after marriage. It must be remembered that there have been millions of admirable and notable wives and mothers who never had a college education. Indeed, I'm strongly of the belief that four years of exposure to the severely rationalistic atmosphere of a place like Smith or Bennington College is enough to ruin a girl for life. I was convinced of this even 30 years ago, and today, in 1970, after the avalanche we have witnessed of feminism, co-education, and the equalitarian dogma, and the general lifting of all obstacles to premarital sexual experience on the part of teenage girls, I do not at the moment know of any college in the land to which I should be willing to entrust the tender destiny of any daughter of mine. Prolonged exposure to such influences will make it difficult for any girl to be content and happy either as wife or as mother. Moreover, girls' education, which, let me remind you, is not necessarily a matter solely of attending school, could continue after they were married. For a year or two at least, they should be able to find considerable leisure time in which to continue their preparation for motherhood and homemaking. Inevitably, as their husbands, in order to support them, if for no other reason, would be considerably older than they, perhaps ten years on the average. Their education after marriage would be largely molded by their husbands. The girl would be somewhat like a younger tree growing up close to another tree that had gotten earlier start and already had its shape. She would shape herself to the life of her husband and nestle into it. This comes naturally to the woman and it makes for unity in the family and for stability in the home. But after all, a mother's most important task is to give her child something deeper than his education, something upon which all his formal education will have to be built and which will largely determine what he does and what he is able to do with all the subsequent training that may come to him. It is hers to determine his fundamental attitudes on life, his characteristic ways of facing the world and of going after things. In the lingo of modern psychology, it is her part, largely, to determine his primary behavior patterns. The practically unalterable ground plan of his whole life, Laura Marholm saw this so clearly and said it so beautifully that I cannot forbear to quote from her book yet again. Her children are the woman's productive work. 
in them becomes manifest what the innermost substance of the mother was, what her natural capital was worth. The productive labor of the woman does not consist in educating her children, as people of this century have believed and upon which many women have exerted all their energies. Education is external work, but what is not in them cannot be brought out of them. At most, only a simulation can be attained. The woman's productive work is not above all a thing wherein much can be achieved by will, intention, effort, design, or training. The productive work of the woman is her inner nature, her inborn character, her warm soul, her good heart, her healthy blood, her unknown strength, her untiring energy, directness, buoyancy, and freshness. When the mother does not rise like the sun over her child, warming so that every tiny limb stretches with pleasure, gladdening with her glance and smile like a peep into the bright morning, waking and alluring forth all that is good and strong and happy and healthy, then she may have very many excellent qualities, and her child may also have many excellent qualities, but qualified for life, he will never quite be. He has been led astray and will lead astray in great things or small. He will be insatiable and insufficient, rough or dull. Or if he is so constituted that he can overcome all that was unpleasant and diseased in his childhood, a thorn will always remain in his side and always a certain unskill in him. He could not suck himself full of healthy blood and warming sun. The feminist demand for more time for education seems to me the only intelligent objection to early marriage for women that can be raised, and when women's education is related to her primary function and the opportunities for education, along with early marriage, fully canvassed, even this objection loses most of its weight and gives way to the urgency of the biological requirement that women begin to function sexually by the time they are 20, or better still, even earlier. To be sure, it can hardly be expected that, as a rule, a teenage girl will have had the experience or will have attained the maturity of judgment that are needed for making a wise choice of a mate. But an essential part of the proposal under examination is that in making the choice, she will have the constant cooperation of, and be very largely guided by, her father and mother. However, the point that I am stressing now is that everything relating to the young woman should be concentrated on motherhood and on homemaking, and it is for this that she should be taught from early girlhood to dedicate herself and to prepare herself as for her highest and holiest calling. And there is none on earth more beautiful or more significant. All will be upon her at times as she wonders whether it may not be given to her to bring into the world a superman, some new great seer or hero to hold him close at her breast and be the one to start his first footsteps out into the world. And to this high end, she will ever keep her body as a holy chalice to be entrusted with something more precious to her than all the golden jewels in the world. For the sake of this, she will eschew any form of sports that might impair her fitness for motherhood, and she will give up any male athleticism, no matter how enjoyable, that is hardening to the bones and muscles of her pelvis. She will recoil from the very thought of ever polluting and profaning her body by drawing into her lungs, close to her very blood, the filthy stink and poison of tobacco smoke, especially of cigarette smoke. And throughout her whole youth, she will gladly subject herself to whatever regimen, as to food, sleep, play, dress, and study that the accumulated wisdom of the race may lay upon her in order that gradually her whole body may be shaped into the soft rounded contours of the lovely female form filled with overflowing health that has put red into her lips, a flush in her cheeks and light in her eyes, and energy into all that she does. And from the combination of theory and practice, of study on the one hand and on the other of watching and helping her mother and having her mother's guidance and assistance even after she is married, she can be prepared to take care of her own first baby and to begin the creation of a home of her own by the time she is 16 or 17. Before the flush of youth and readiness 
that is then upon her begins to wither, as it certainly and rapidly does, sometime before she has reached the age of 20, she and her parents together will have found her a suitable husband, and she will go forth with him to create the one that is more than those who created it, which Nietzsche declared to be the condition for a holy marriage. Before I bring this paper to a close, I wish to take a look at the problem of the unmarried woman. Lin Yu Tang, in his My Country and My People, approaching this question from the point of view of China and the Orient, where motherhood always has been looked upon as a woman's most important function and one necessary to her fulfillment, declares that, in Chinese eyes, the greatest sin of Western society is the large number of unmarried women, who, through no fault of their own, are unable to express themselves. And certainly, no unmarried women are found among the Mohammedans. And incidentally, no class of working women forced to earn their daily bread either. Or among the Hindus, where, as we have seen, it is considered one of the first duties of every father to obtain a husband for each of his daughters before she is three years past puberty. So much so that if he fails to do this, the girl is at liberty to take the initiative and hunt for a husband herself. This liberty, to be sure, is allowed our girls too, but I am frequently indignant over the way parents leave their daughters to shift for themselves in this matter, not making the least exertion even to bring their daughters into contact with men who would make them desirable husbands. Perhaps the problem of the unmarried woman has never been so great as it is in the West today, and it is much larger and more acute than most people realize. Over 25 years ago, the article came out in Collier's entitled Husband Shortage. It began by saying that America is headed towards a permanent surplus of from 6 to 8 million marriageable women who will have to do without husbands. The situation is already so serious that one out of every seven girls now seems headed for spinsterhood. The simple fact is social dynamite. It can rock the foundations of our social system and attitudes towards sex. The cause of this situation is more than we can go into here, though it obviously challenges our country to summon all its strength and wisdom to find a remedy. But here I want only to call upon my readers to face with me the facts. Surely even a fool must see that if some legal and helpful way is not provided by which to prevent such grievous wrong and deprivation to such a multitude of women, then clandestine and demoralizing ways, often damaging alike to the women and to society, will be seized upon by the women themselves. Said Carl Gustav Jung in his contributions to analytic psychology, it is no longer a question of a dozen or so of voluntary or involuntary old maids here and there. It is a matter of millions. Our legal code and our social morality offer no answer to this question. There are decent women who want to marry, and if this is not possible, well, the next best thing. When it comes to the question of love, ideas, institutions, and laws mean far less to women than ever before. If things cannot take a straight path, it will have to be a crooked one. I caught an inkling of how acute the problem was becoming from an experience that I had 30 years ago. I had gone to speak at a certain university through a letter of introduction from one of my older friends, I found myself at dinner with an elderly lady and her unmarried daughter. In the course of the meal, the former turned to me and blurted out, what would you say to a young woman of 30 who had a good position as a nurse but recognized that the one thing she wanted above all else was to become a mother, and yet knew no man she wanted to marry? It was perfectly obvious that she was referring to her own daughter. Taken by surprise, I did not at the moment know what to say, but from then on I began to give the problem some thought and study, so that now, while I am not sure that much can be done to alleviate the plight of these women at the present time, I see quite clearly and am prepared to state and to stand for certain things which I believe can entirely remove the problem in the future. To begin with, we must remember and engrave upon our memories that life is more important and more sacred than the institutions in which, at any given time, it finds expression. If it be true, and it is, as I have already insisted in these pages more than once, 
that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, then it is true, no less, that the state was made for man and not man for the state, and likewise our systems of education and economics and politics and marriage. When the unfolding life of the chick can no longer be contained within the eggshell, it breaks the shell. And when the forms drawn upon by a previous age for the direction of the sexual relations of men and women no longer fit the actual life of today, when these forms thrust life into what, for very large numbers, is virtually a straitjacket or a torture chamber, then these forms have got to give way to others that will allow life an outlet and room to turn around in. Confucius said, truth does not depart from human nature. If what is regarded as truth departs from human nature, it may not be regarded as truth. To this end, so far as the unmarried woman is concerned, the following changes in principle or practice seem to me to be called for. 1. It must be universally recognized that upon certain clearly stated, scientifically grounded and well-established conditions, motherhood is every mature, well-constituted woman's right. Lin Yu Tang declares that, of all the rights of women, the greatest is to be a mother. Confucius spoke of the ideal society as the one in which there were no unmarried men or women, and this, in China, has been achieved through a different conception of romance and marriage. And again, to every girl born in China, a home of her own is provided. Society insists that even slave girls should be married off at the proper age. I shall have more respect for the women's rights movement when I see more women pressing for a recognition of their right to be mothers. 2. Society has a right to protect itself against having undesirable children thrust upon it. Any unmarried woman, therefore, who wished to have a child or children would first have to meet all the eugenic requirements as to sound ancestry and health of body, of mind, and of character that any sensible society must make for marriage itself, and she would be required to show that she had the independent means or other source of dependable income by which she could, without a husband, provide the security so necessary for both mother and child. But with such conditions fully met, she would be given permission to be inseminated, either naturally by the man of her choice or artificially by quite impersonal scientific selection. In either case, of course, the man who supplied the sperm would have to meet the same eugenic requirements as applied to the woman, and no stigma, whatever, would attach either to her or to her offspring. Such a procedure would be one of the unusual but recognized ways of having children. It would be an arrangement not wholly desirable, but less undesirable than leaving so many women childless. With the required economic security, through independent income, family assistance, or the like, the woman would be no worse off than many a woman is today who loses her husband, say, through death. The inevitable influence of such a departure would be to induce society to make the changes that would enable every desirable woman to marry who wishes to. It would be especially good if the church, or whatever religious institution may succeed the church, were to make itself especially responsible for the welfare of such women and children, somewhat as the Catholic Church has for centuries done in the case of its nuns, giving them a form of marriage and a wedding ring, and thus status and security and a spiritual comfort that would help the women enormously to carry through their undertaking faithfully and proudly. And perhaps the need of a father could, to a considerable extent, be met by reviving the institution of the Godfather. In any case, all possible efforts should be made to have every child grow up in close and warm relations with a suitable and responsible man in his or her life. 3. So long as the great excess of females over males persists, and this excess may even be enormously increased by another world war, we may find ourselves compelled to make sufficient relaxation of our monogamous standards to allow men who are financially able to have more than one wife or to introduce concubinage. To most people brought up in our Christian environment, I presume this idea would be abhorrent, at least at first glance. 
but I suspect that prejudice has a good deal to do with this attitude, and if force of circumstances presses hard enough, people can be made to look their prejudices in the face and even to rise above them. If the outstanding ecclesiastical body of the Church of England can go so far as to consider a resolution to allow a temporary polygamy to build up the population weakened by war's decimation of the males, it ought not to be too much to ask that there be a sufficient relaxation of the monogamous standard to give the millions of our women who today are doomed to spinsterhood the opportunity to live, for again, though it be for the thousandth time, as a rule, for the well-constituted woman, life without motherhood is no life at all. This is said in behalf of justice, and to some extent, in the interest of eugenics, it is anything but a counsel to promiscuity or an excuse for laxity. I long ago came to a well-considered judgment against free sexual relations as any ideal. Many years of observation, experience, study, and reflection have satisfied me that, on the whole, as a rule, the basically monogamous family is the form under which human life flourished best. But like the historian Lecky, who, in his History of European Morals, declared that we have ample grounds for maintaining that the lifelong union of one man and of one woman should be the normal or dominant type of intercourse between the sexes, I would go on with him to add, it by no means follows that because this should be the dominant type, that it should be the only one, or that the interests of society demand that all connections should be forced into the same die. The author of the Husband Shortage article from which I quoted a few pages back, as he searched about for an answer, observed, when a shortage of men becomes the permanent situation, polygamy in one form or another has been resorted to by most people in the non-Christian countries as the simplest means of providing every woman with a mate, considered her fundamental right. And contrary to what is believed, women in many places are not only not averse to sharing a husband, but prefer the arrangement. One is only to let one's eye rove freely over the world and down the pages of history, and indeed penetrate beneath the surface of our own life to discover plenty of precedent for some departure from a confinement of the sexual relations of each woman to one man, and of each man to one woman, that is, from monogamy in its strictest sense. Among the ancient Hindus are to be found not only the marriage of one woman to several men, but that of one man to several women. O. A. Wall reminds us that among the early Hebrews, monogamy was the general rule, although it was not very strict. Later on, polygamy and concubinage became prevalent. There are many references to concubines in the Old Testament, even at the present time. In Mohammedan lands, there is no limit to the number of concubines a man may possess. Concubinage is common in China. It existed in the Viking Age among the Scandinavian peoples. In European lands, concubinage was general until quite recent times, and the position of the concubine was an honorable one. It also persists among the European nobility in the form of morganatic marriages, which are entered upon from love, and when later official marriages must be contracted for state reasons, these left-handed marriages are either discontinued or maintained on the quiet, along with the official family, thus constituting polygamy. In such morganatic marriages, the title or rank is not inherent by the children, but no disgrace attaches to this or to the woman. Even in our country, we have today what Professor Ellsworth Huntington calls consecutive polygamy, that is, a system whereby divorce is so easy and frequent that many people have several husbands or wives one after the other. I read recently that, on the average, one out of four American marriages ends in divorce. In the West, the average is three out of four. And no matter what may be our ideals in our laws, there simply is no question but that, at least, our male population is not strictly monogamous. O. A. Wall, though he declares his belief that monogamy based on the equality of the woman with the man is the highest type of sexual relationship, is forced nevertheless to recognize that man is polygamous by nature, and polygamy is therefore the prevailing type of sexual relationship throughout the world. It is the legally recognized relationship of the sexes among more than two-thirds of the inhabitants of the earth. 
and it is practiced in some form or other by all nations on the globe. A strictly monogamous people does not exist, and strict monogamy in the individual man is as uncommon as strict celibacy even among us. The last statement is fully confirmed by the Kinsey Report of 1948, and by common knowledge of what is going on today in our open college dormitories where men and women mix freely. Furthermore, from the point of view of positive eugenics, as was first brought to my attention by Professor Ellsworth Huntington, there is a good deal to be said for polygamy. The men who are able to support more than one wife, in any case always comparatively few, so that in practice polygamy can never be very extensive, are men of capacity. On the average, they rank high for their constitution, personality, and brains. They court and are usually able to win women who are as much above the average as they are themselves. The offspring that a man of this caliber might have by several such women could be counted upon to prove as a rule both numerous and superior. Ramesses II, Professor Huntington points out, was one of the greatest kings of Egypt. He has the usual array of wives and concubines, and it is said to have had about 160 children. King David is reported to have had 19 sons. Besides the sons of his concubines, while Harold Fairhair of Norway divided his kingdom among about 20 sons, he also calls attention to many other subsidiary conditions, which tend to cause the children who are born with a high inheritance to be proportionately far more numerous than among us. And all this, of course, for anyone who cares about the increase of quality in human life, is of great importance. Finally, I think that we, who would defend the institution of monogamy, but especially all those who flatly oppose any modification of its standards or deviation from its rules, would do well to recognize the justice of the charge leveled against it by the critics that its inseparable concomitant is prostitution or some other form of extramarital sexual relationship. On the one hand, the monogamous society undertakes to confine the sexual experience, at least of its women, to marriage. And this seems to me absolutely basic and indispensable, except as there is a stable environment rooted in the definite and durable relations of a man and a woman, together with the certainty as to the paternity of her children, the institution of the home is impossible. I see the home as at once the core and the foundation of our whole life. It always has been. I cannot imagine the Indo-Germanic peoples ever giving it up. Ludovici states the conclusions of James Corin as well as his own when he says, This sacrifice of the female's free mating privilege is essential to our progress and the successful survival of our culture. All control of family lines and eugenic improvement depends upon it. But let us look a little further into what the institution involves. According to the avowed ideal, the sex of each woman is shut up within marriage and thereby made inaccessible except to her husband. If she marries before 20, as we have seen that she should, and if her husband is an adequate sexual partner, this will subject her to none of the painful and often injurious effects of prolonged repression. But with the males, it is a different story. In order to complete their education and to lay the foundation for the support of a family, they have to put off marriage until they are from 25 to 30 or even older. But my investigations have completely satisfied me that the male sexual instinct is such that most men, even those of the highest type, simply cannot keep it all bottled up for 15 or 20 years. The proportion that find a fully satisfying outlet in sublimation is very small. The great majority go to prostitutes, make casual connections, find a mistress, or resort to masturbation. Also, it is argued, to my mind, not without considerable cogency, that the very success of an eventual marriage may depend upon a young man's having had at least enough sexual experience beforehand to be qualified to initiate his bride. Moreover, even after marriage, many men's work takes them from home often for weeks and even months at a time, and it is urged by some that during pregnancy a woman should not be disturbed with intercourse. Indeed, certainly true of females in the animal world simply refuse sexual relations. Apparently, too, as we have seen, many men experience a desire for sexual change that is beyond their powers of control. 
All the authorities on the sexual problem that I have examined, notably Bloch and Forel, seem agreed that by instinct the human male is polygamous. Well now, if all this is fact, as it seems to be, where is all this constantly surging sexual demand to go? It would certainly break into and destroy our monogamous homes, as it is now doing in our open college dormitories, if there were not a body of free women who in one way or another are set aside, or who set themselves aside, to satisfy it. So the pronouncement of Bertrand Russell seems justified that the prostitute safeguards the virtues of wives and daughters. You don't like it? No, neither do I. Though, before the coming of venereal disease, some 400 years ago, as for instance, in those beautiful times of the Middle Ages, the entire provision for this surging male sexuality would seem to have been something very different from and very much less objectionable than what we today know as prostitution. I recall, too, a chapter in Terms de Unstubliche, Terms the Immortal, by Paul Niff Verlag, Vienna, 1956, which I read some 15 years ago. It is the very stirring tale of the odyssey of a young man who, in the days of the Athenian Empire in the 5th century BC, is buffeted by winds and fate from one side of the eastern end of the Mediterranean to the other. Eventually, he comes to the island of Sicily, where Athenian colonists had built an advanced culture, largely inspired by Athens. One evening, he climbs the hill above town that was crowned with a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Here he is received by one of the young and beautiful women who have dedicated themselves to the services of the goddess, perhaps by the priestess of the temple herself. I am not sure which, my recollections are vague, but in any case, she is a woman of evident culture with whom he discusses life and art and philosophy before they retire for the night. The whole experience is recounted simply and casually, without any suggestion of the lascivious. In terms mind, there was nothing exceptional about it. It was commonplace, completely out in the open, and it was in a temple. Supposedly, I must remark, the tale is based on historical realities, though I must allow that I have never followed up my reading of it to inquire about such institutions in ancient Greek life. But for our present purposes, let us assume that the tale is true to historical fact and go on to appraise Term's experience. I am afraid that the preconceptions, values, and mood with which those ancient Greeks faced the realities of human existence were so far removed from ours that we cannot enter into them with any sympathy or even imagine, let alone really fathom, the moral and spiritual and social world that created such an arrangement as Turms described. I do not for a moment profess that I can, but from my reading of the chapter I did carry away a lingering impression that whatever may have been the outward and inward reality of the institution of which Terms gave us a glimpse, it was the result of a reverent and honest attitude toward life, which made a deliberate effort to draw a veil of sanctity over the whole of the procreative instinct, even over its overflow into extramarital channels. With this may be compared what Abbot J. A. Dubois said about dancers and prostitutes who are attached to the service of the temples in Hindu India. They are called servants of the gods. The institution is interwoven with the accepted social and religious life of India. The book has a preface by Max Muller. It certainly did not carry with it any taint of the shame and degradation that is brought to our minds today by mention of the word prostitution. But I judge that, before we peoples of the West could ever shape an institution anything like it, we should have to come under the molding thumb of a religion very different from Christianity, and for a long time know a feeling, a need, a wish, and a will that are quite far from us now. And in the meantime, though I certainly find our modern prostitution abhorrent, I would accept it rather than forfeit the monogamous family that seems to depend upon it for existence. And I should like to take this opportunity to point out that some of the deepest misery in the lot of the prostitute today is unnecessary and results from the sheer hypocrisy that closes its eyes to her existence and refuses to acknowledge that all society is profoundly indebted to her for what she does. But I have briefly reviewed the precedent that we have for some departure from the strict and logical requirements of our monogamous ideal. 
but little, if any, of this is incompatible with the essentials of our institution of monogamy itself. The recognized unit of the family, the concentration of responsibility in the two parents, the definite and more or less constant environment in which the children can be cared for and trained, and, in detail, can learn the lessons necessary for later life in the larger world. Such are the essential features of monogamous family life. And assuming love and capacity on the part of the parents, all these are possible on two conditions. That the sexual relations of the wife, or conceivably in some few cases of the wives, are strictly confined to the husband, so that he can be sure that the responsibilities he is called upon to meet are toward his own children, and, two, that the thought, devotion, and responsibility of the joint procreators unite in their children and in their home. The institution would not be essentially altered by the admission in some small proportion of the families of an extra woman or so, or by either premarital or extramarital sexual experience on the part of the male. The institution does hinge, however, on sexual restriction in the case of the female. My sense of the importance of this for society was considerably reinforced by my discovery years ago of the scholarly researches of J. D. Unwin. These he presented in his work, Sex and Culture, an abstract of which is to be found in an address entitled Sexual Regulations and Cultural Behavior, later published as a book, which he gave before the medical section of the British Psychological Society. His thesis is mainly that, on all levels, there is an unvarying correlation between culture and sexual restriction. The narrowing of sexual opportunity, especially in the female, is always followed in about three generations, the time necessary for the results to take effect, by a rise in the cultural level. Apparently, the explanation is that when restraint is placed upon the sexual impulse of a population, there is a gradual accumulation of energy that finds an outlet in exploration, conquest of every sort, both material and spiritual, and every sort of cultural creativeness. He declares that whereas, on the one hand, as soon as the absolutely polygamous tradition was inherited by a complete new generation, the energy of the society decreased. He cites the Moors as an example. On the other hand, there is no record case of a society reducing its opportunity to a minimum without displaying expansive energy. In conclusion, he goes so far as to say, if the behavior of a society depends on the amount of its energy, and if the amount of its energy is a reflection of the sexual opportunity it enjoys, it seems to follow that we can make a society behave in any manner we like if we are permitted to give it such sexual regulations as will produce the behavior we desire. At least it should ensure its having energy, but energy alone would not of itself ensure its taking a desirable direction. The stress that Mr. Unwin places upon sexual restriction may seem to be at odds with the changes that I have advocated in behalf of our very large number of unmarried women, but I believe that it is not, needless to say, between the claims for restriction and the claims for expression, there must be a certain balance. Complete restriction is impossible of attainment, and completely free expression would make for chaos and ruin. At a minimum, there must be enough expression to perpetuate the species and to avoid the physical and psychic disturbances that follow upon too complete or too prolonged repression. There must be enough restriction to ensure that we have the accumulated energy to take us towards the goal which, as a people, we have set before us. Every single thing that I have advocated or defended, whether it be for the motherhood or those of our unmarried women who are qualified, or for the extra nuptial sexual experience of our men, is intended the more fully to justify and to establish the essential features of our monogamous family system and to facilitate its contented and fruitful operation. Monogamous marriage should remain our norm, and a single lifelong union our ideal. But let me say again, it is high time that the West unite with the East in a worldwide recognition that motherhood is every mature, desirable woman's right, 
and her deep organic and constitutional need. And such changes must be made both in our thinking and in our institutions as may prove necessary to provide her with opportunity for motherhood on the best basis possible. It is time now to draw all the threads of this study of woman together. As we have seen, men and women are not equal. That is, it is impossible to make them out the same. All effort to gloss over their differences or to pretend that they can be alike in their functions is the most absurd folly and most pernicious in its consequences. Wherever this false notion goes, it makes men and women alike renegade to their respective sex and to their respective obligations to society. Nor yet is it a matter of saying that they are unequal. Equality is the wrong concept to introduce here. Men and women are incommensurables. They are fundamentally different creatures. Each is necessary to the other, and each has a part to play that is absolutely essential for the life of the race. But their roles are in different directions, and their meaning to one another and the fulfillment of their respective parts in the life of the race, indeed, their very organic health, depends on each one's maintaining the difference that belongs to him or to her, a polar difference with a strong electric tension between. The deepest instinct in the woman is her mother feeling. She mothers or would mother everything, her own children, her own husband, and all children, especially children that suffer or want loving care and fending for. Indeed, at her best, her sympathy and her tenderness make her to reach out her arms to all life that suffers as though she would gather it to her breast and there warm and feed it. Man, on the other hand, at his best, is the maker, the shaper, the creator. He shapes everything. He is the idealist, never contented with things as they are. He always is the one who struggles and sacrifices himself to shape them according to his thought and his vision. He shapes himself, his wife, his child, society, everything. He is the originator. Even the influence of the woman on the children is based on values and standards sprung from the intellect of man. As mother and center of the home, woman is the settled one, the stable one, the contented one, the one that holds all things together, tying together past, present, and future, the one that lives closest to the earth and to actuality. It is her part to ensure the continuity of the race. She begins the new life into the world, and she provides the atmosphere in which this new life gets started, gets footed, begins to find the shape that belongs to it. Man, on the other hand, is the one upon whom depends form, values, standards, goals, in short, the quality of the race. Which part is the more important, the woman's or the man's? Is it an idle question? Is it not apparent that neither can exist without the other? I do believe that without the function of the male, the human race would degenerate perhaps in time, degenerate even to the point of barbarism. If all men became as concerned about reproduction as women are, and as tender-hearted, who would weed out the weaklings and defectives whom we must get rid of or perish? Who then would inflict the suffering that is necessary if a stable and desirable society is to be set up and maintained? Who then would be to the race the jab and the stab, the lure and the leaven, the light and the dynamite that men have been, ever declaring that this is no place to stop and pitch our tents and weakly cry in excuse, we have gone far enough, high enough, let us rest here. To all such weariness and defeatedness, it has been man's part, the true man's part, ever to declare and to insist that there is no place far enough or high enough to stop and to lie down and to sleep. Man has a part in keeping the race going on, but his most important role is to keep it ever seeking a beyond, ever going farther and climbing higher. Without this, 
if there were only the instinct of the female, we should have the tendency that we witness where the herd instinct, closely related to the female instinct, is dominant, the tendency towards the nation of well-fed cows. Personality and significance of all sorts would then be sacrificed to perpetuation and to security. On the other hand, if it were not for the woman, man, this great shaper, would have nothing to shape. The danger would be that, with his stargazing and star-grasping idealism, he would fly off the earth altogether. The part of each is necessary. The part of each is indispensable to that of the other. And it is best when the question as to which part is the more important is not even raised, but each of the sexes is so proud of its part and so full of it that it simply accepts it and fulfills it. To a considerable extent, of course, the roles of the two sexes overlap and are shared. The man also, deeply and in the very highest sort of way, is devoted to the children and to the home and the woman is so caught up and inspired by the concern for quality of life that she is seen incarnated in the men with whom she has grown up or loved, father, brothers, husband, that she stands solidly behind them in all the nobility of their striving and will not infrequently be the one to drive them out to self-sacrifice and to death rather than see them live on in dishonor. Witness the magnificent burning speech with which the Queen Draupadi attempted to arouse her men, and the equally heroic Kunti, her son. But lest there be any lingering suspicion that I am consigning woman to the lesser place, let me leave you with this. Nietzsche, who first confronted me with the problem that has occupied us in this chapter and in the last one, said many hard things about women as indeed he did about men, so much so that probably many women have been led to think of him as their enemy. And yet, it was Nietzsche who said, among many other beautiful things, that the perfect woman is a higher type of humanity than the perfect man, and also something much rarer. And while the two greatest influences that have entered my thinking life have been Jesus and Nietzsche, Yet I question whether in the last analysis the debt I owe to either of them, or to both of them together, is so great as that which I owe to my mother. I don't mean that it was she who gave me the great ideas or who trained my mind. She gave me something more elemental, more necessary. She gave me that without which I could never really have seen such men as Jesus and Nietzsche, seen them for what they were, or been ready as I was to respond to them when I found them. So, I say again, my deepest debt is to my mother.